enterprise resource planning and the lessons learned from that. Um, we have with us and logisticians who are actually capable of standing up their own name tents, uh, which is a <laughs> marvelous capability. Um, a very wonderful panel here this morning. Uh, I will introduce each of them and then turn the microphone over to, uh, to the panel lead, General John Handy. Uh, General John Handy, of course, has a, has a long and distinguished Air Force career, uh, including uh, ultimately the commander of the U.S. Transportation Command. He was the vice chief of staff of the Air Force. He was the commander of the U.S. Air Force Air Mobility Command. Uh, now he is a consultant, and of course, he is a world-class expert on defense, transportation, logistics, and global supply chain management. Um, to the tune of very few others who come out of that arena. And we're really quite honored to have him here this morning. Joining him on the panel, uh, Kevin Carroll, who was the uh, former program executive officer of Enterprise Information Systems. Most of you know that the structure of acquisition decision making in the Defense Department, as set up by the, the Goldwater Nichols Act that, uh, uh, that Dr. Carter mentioned, uh, the program executive officer is the critical link between the program and the ultimate acquisition executive at the service level. And so we're very uh, privileged to have uh, Kevin with us here this morning, reflecting that from the Enterprise Information Systems perspective. And finally, David Fisher, who today is is, uh, and it, in fact is the first permanent director of the Defense Department's Business Transformation Agency uh, at where he's been in place for the last three years, uh, actually four years, but three years as a permanent uh, uh, director. Uh, prior to that, he had a very distinguished business career and he brings uh, both aspects to the table today. So with that, um, I will uh, welcome our panel and turn the microphone over to General Handy. David, hey, thank you very much. I uh, look at this assignment as one that much like I just told my two panelists here that we've got an hour and ten minutes to solve world hunger. As I read it, ERP in the logistics world, lessons learned. Now we could sit here for hours and perhaps days and weeks on that subject. And so mindful of the time, I've asked each of the panelists to give a brief description of, of their any background that may not have been covered by David and then make a statement about this particular subject matter with an eye towards getting to the questions as soon as we possibly can. And much like any audience, I find that it's the questions that are of far more value than it is listening to us talk about our perspectives about anything to do with this particular topic. And I'll just emphasize, David sort of made a hint when he introduced Ash Carter that there were no topics to be discussed with regards to tanker or 135. I would just like to emphasize and congratulate David on that point and, and suggest that this is logistics. And even if it's PBL, we're not going to address it. So thank you if you'll, you'll stick to the topic at hand. I'm also pleased that so many of you decided to stay for the panel after the, the speaker. It's impressive to me as the, as the leader, Ray, is chiding me a little bit. So with having said that, let me start with Kevin. We'll work across, and then we'll get to your questions as soon as we possibly can. Okay. Um, well, good morning. I'm uh, Kevin Carroll. I actually started as a contracting officer. That's my background. So, uh, so I grew up as a contracting person, but buying IT systems, and then moved into program management, and eventually moved into the ERP systems. Uh, so over my span of about 32 years in government service, 28 of which was with the U.S. Army, uh, the focus for me mostly was IT systems, the acquiring of them, the fielding of them, the support of them. And uh, when I left PEOEIS, by the way, uh, to follow up uh, to Mr. Carter's comments about uh, people in theater, the business system area really, when, when the first Bush uh, went to Iraq, we basically had 10 people in, uh, in support of the services there at the PEO in Iraq. Uh, when I left, Two years ago, we had 350 people, more people than the other PEOs. You would think there'd be more from the, the IED guys, more from the PE soldier guys, more from whatever. But actually, we had the, uh, the most of the people in supporting logistics, medical, personnel. So you can see a big change in a fairly short time as to uh, supporting the business system. So, so that's going to continue. I don't think that will change. As most of you in logistics know, uh, it wasn't too long ago you had no connectivity to report back any readiness data. Uh, now you have it, uh, for the most part. The connectivity is there. 
the systems have kind of matured enough to provide that, most of them being legacy systems, uh, to provide that data. And now we do have the issue of information overload, how do we manage the data, uh, how can we get, get better at command and control. And that's in true for logistics, medical, finance, and, and personnel. So really the, the area that, uh, that I'm experienced in implementing ERPs have really forced us to do two things uh, when I was at the PEO, and I think it's still true today of Gary Winkler, uh, the person that replaced me, is you've got that short-term thinking that you have to do to support the war fight, and that does take up your day, a good part of it. But at the same time, you cannot ignore where we're going to the future, where the enterprise is going at. And so as we try to implement uh, the ERPs across the, uh, the Army, uh, we really are, are trying at the PE. PEO stage to really try to bring a lot of the things together and try to maneuver our way really with our customers, with our oversight bodies, with the, the Dave Fisher and the, B, the BTA at the DOD level, and really try to find a way to, again, juggle uh, the various communities and their interest to try to get something to the field and, and fast. And I basically really break my lessons learned down into uh, three categories. And the first category would be people and governance. Um, we learned a lot about the importance of having a champion, somebody in that functional community that could really be a champion and make things happen. And we learned that at DLA, because DLA really was the first ERP implementation where you had a commander who made it uh, a daily topic of his life to drive uh, DLA to change and to change towards an ERP solution. And that was a really uh, a thing that we learned in the Army. We had limited success with that. We had some people that were strong proponents, but at the beginning that wasn't so true. Uh, it took a little while before we could build up a champion uh, that could really drive the community, the functional community, to be looking to change the way we do business and to be able to implement these ERPs. Because as you know, most people outside of Washington, you know, we, they'll salute us when we get out that they're going to accept these ERPs when they come out, but the truth is, they don't see anything come out of Washington usually. So most of the time they just are nice and friendly and would like to take our money if we bring it to them. But for the most part, they don't see that anything's going to happen in their lifetime. So it takes a lot of, uh, there's a lot of not, I guess it's passive resistance in a sense of not really wanting to change or expecting change. So you really need somebody that has to force it down mid-management and into the community and do so uh, with a person who is very well respected in the community and, and has that knowledge and control. And in logistics, that's important because, as you know, um, logistics there in the Army even, uh, we have national logistics, tactical logistics. Most soldiers and civilians know one or the other. Very few know both. Uh, General Stevenson might be, for example, an, a, the exception of that, uh, the G4 of the Army right now. He knows both. but. It's very hard to find someone that understands the end-to-end -end logistics community. And so finding a champion, someone to do, that's a big, big deal. Uh, the governance structure, uh, quite honestly, we really didn't have one, and, and still struggling, to be honest with you, to have one in the Army. Um, at the enterprise level, we could not bring together the communities, uh, uh, the functional communities that well, the finance, logistics, personnel, uh, on these ERP implementations. and. Um, and that's been a struggle that's ongoing today. I think it's gotten better today, but it's been a struggle to get an enterprise integration look at these systems to help with integration versus interfacing. And that's been a big, big challenge for us to do that. At the program level, we had a lot of trouble and, uh, of getting the, the right people together. And a good example, I think, that worked fairly well was the logistics modernization program. Uh, once it became an acquisition program of record, uh, General Mortensen, who was the deputy AMC commander, took a personal interest. He was there every month, every, spent a day to ensure that the issues were on the table, as well as the PEO organization, as well as um, the functional community that was receiving the systems, in the Army's case, CECOM, AMCOM, TACOM, and as well as the contractor, and I'll give a plug to uh, Austin Yerkes here, they're not a client, by the way, they are not a client. but. Um, but uh, to Austin York, because he took a day out of his time at CSC to be there to ensure that issues that, that were going on in that program got surfaced and that we had a, a more long-term, not a short-term look 
uh, at what we wanted to do to get that system fielding. So that kind of really did gel well and created, I believe, uh, a, an avenue for the program shops, both on the contractor and the government side, to get issues up, get them decided, get them moving, and get that system fielded. And it's not quite fielded all the way yet. It goes to take home this summer, and then that would be the last fielding. So that went pretty good. The other area that I think is real important, and I know just a couple more minutes, implementation. Um, basically, you got to think big, implement small. Um, we tended to think big, implement big. And that hasn't worked so well. Um, so we really, uh, the lesson learned to us was really we need to understand what we're doing better. Architecture is a good example of this. Quite honestly, and I hope, hope Dave uh, doesn't mind me saying this, I would have to try to find a way around Dave in a sense because there was an architecture, but nobody really kind of in, in the Army knew what we had to do. But we knew if we went in there and felt around it, we'd get our check mark. And we needed that check mark or else Dave wouldn't give us any money. So we, uh, so, but we really didn't understand the relationship between architecture and the procurement or the acquisition. And that's the thing that we learned and it's gotten, and, and things have gotten better about this. What artifacts come out of the architecture that lead into the acquisition process that then lead to delivery of a system that's looking at the, the big picture, that's looking at the enterprise and how things play together. So that was a big, big lesson to learn. Uh, and, um, I would also say uh, the third area that I just wanted to mention that lessons learned is the ACT strategy, the, and that means oversight as well. The IT oversight system doesn't really work. I mean, if you look at the defense panel, uh, the panel on defense reform that just came out and had 16 percent of major IT systems are, are successful in their judgment. Now, I don't know. The trouble we have is we don't know if um, it's sort of like baseball. If you don't know anything about baseball and you come to the United States or Cuba or Japan, and you find out that people only get a hit 25% of their time at bat, but that, you know, it doesn't sound so good. 25% is the only time you get a hit. I don't know if NIT systems of 16% is good or bad, because we really don't know what industry successes are to, to benchmark it against. But assuming it's similar, and I bet it probably is, uh, the 16% might not be uh, as bad as it sounds, however, I do know the oversight process uh, has not added to any improved successes of those systems getting out. It's very difficult, very long to get these systems out. LMP, GCSS Army, GFIBS, uh, all those programs, if you look back and, and, and could see, and, that we, and they are documented, to see what kind of, of time it took to get approvals, uh, you would be shocked. Uh, how long that took for little issues. There were almost no value add, quite honestly. Um, so we need to kind of adopt a better oversight thing. Uh, the BTA with the ERM, uh, which was a risk management system, is better. I mean, that was a better way of looking. At least we're looking at risk. We realize things are going to go bad. How do we manage risk? How do we keep it under control and deliver? So we definitely need to follow some of the work that uh, ITAAC is doing uh, some of the work that uh, John Gilliam and the guys are doing uh, with the defense sector right now with ideas of how to improve how we do IT acquisition oversight and procurement and to do it in a way that's much more best commercial practice rather than the way we've been doing it in the past. And, and so those are kind of the generic lessons learned, I think, that I've experienced at PEOEIS. Thanks, Kevin. David? All right, good morning. Thank you, everybody, for the, the opportunity and for, for coming out on this Friday morning. Um, lessons learned in ERP. Um, I'll, I'll agree with most of what, what Kevin said is some of the most important lessons that I would say we've identified. I'm not sure how many we've actually learned, though. Um, we've identified a lot of lessons, things that have been a problem. Uh, if, but by saying we've learned them, that means we're doing something about it, and we've gotten better. And in many of the cases, the ones that Kevin has described and a couple that I'm going to articulate, I'm not sure if that's really the case. And I'll try to get uh, to a point of where I'm optimistic in the end of our opportunity to learn them because of some of the fundamental changes that have just recently occurred, in part thanks to legislation. Um, but I want to highlight some of the things in this whole ERP space um, that I think are some of the critical ones that we need to learn and do something about. Just some perspective. Um, you know, for the business mission area of the Department of Defense, we have bet the farm on these ERP systems. 
We have stopped spending on the legacy. We are spending a ton of money on the 14 or 15 or so things that we would call ERP systems today. We'll spend $1.15 billion on those systems this year. We have spent over $9 billion on them in the last decade. I'll let that number sink in for a second, because I know in the Department of Defense, $9 billion is not a lot of money for certain things. For IT systems, about a dozen, 14 or so systems, $9 billion is a lot of money. Again, if we want to compare it to industry, um, that's not a number that industry can frankly even understand how much we've invested in trying to improve. And then the question is, what are the results? And I think one of the indicators of results are, well, how much of these are actually being used? And if you look at our TOA, our Total Obligation Authority, it's, uh, the, I know the Navy just increased its usage of Navy ERP. At, prior to that, it was under 10% of our TOA was actually being managed in this nine plus billion dollars worth of investment. Um, it's, probably, it's over 10% now, I'm not exactly sure where the number is, uh, but it's still a, a, a small minority in terms of what we're actually using, let alone getting productive benefit out of. Um, so a couple of reasons why I think that might be. First of all, we treat these as technology projects. They are not technology projects. Uh, as somebody said to me not that long ago, they are sociology projects. This is all about people. It's about us. It's about change. It's not about little change. It's about real change, big change. We're not coming in with these new ERP systems and simply taking what you do today and making it a little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit more automated. It's fundamentally changing how we do the business today. And there is a lot of resistance to that. And, but we don't treat them as sociology projects that are change-oriented. We treat them as acquisition projects and technology projects. And that's a problem uh, because those focuses are not on the areas that are the most resistant and problematic in what we're trying to deliver. Um, second piece of that, and it's related, and it ties, it tied to how, it's tied to how we're organized in the Department of Defense. Uh, Dr. Carter was talking earlier you know, about the issues of jointness and Goldwater Nichols and how we fight jointly, but we don't necessarily acquire things jointly. We certainly don't execute the business mission of the department jointly. We execute the business mission of the department in as stovepiped a manner as you can possibly formulate. Um, why is this a problem? We talk about logistics ERP systems. That's a uh, an oxymoron to me. There's no such thing as in a logistics ERP system. That's not what ERP systems are. They are enterprise systems. They are designed to facilitate end-to-end -end business process transactions. You can't have a logistics transaction in an ERP without a finance transaction associated with it. You acquire an asset. Are we going to acquire that asset and track it from a property standpoint in one ERP system, yet we're going to depreciate it and track the dollars in a different ERP system? In the Department of Defense mindset, the answer to that is yes. That is what we are planning to do. We are going to procure something in one system, we are going to receive it in another ERP system, and we are going to account for it in another ERP system. That is not the way ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems, are designed to work. But that's how we're organized. That's how we think. And part of the problem is to optimize that whole thing, that end-to-end -end capability, we sometimes need to sub-optimize a piece. And that's where the resistance really kicks in. So I liken it to, um, you know, we are, we are rational creatures of habit. We, I, I liken it to our morning commute. What do we do in the morning? We drive to work, at least I do, exactly the same way every day. Why do we do that? Because that's a rational thing to do. When I moved to Washington about five years ago, I chartered out a few different courses on how to get to work. I figured out the best one, and by gosh, I'm going to do that every day. I figured out the right one. Okay, so we've been doing that for, 20, well, for me, five years. Other people in business have been doing things for 20 years the same way, and it's a rational thing to do. And now here comes the change. Somebody comes in from the, from the pl uh, traffic planning uh, corporate entity, whoever that may be, and says, you know what, we're going to redesign how we're going to, everyone's going to commute. And for 80% of you, it's going to get better. 
For 10 or 20% of you, it's going to get a little worse. But you know what? Do it anyway because it's for the greater good. Well, from a greater good standpoint, that's perfectly rational. Why would we not all comply with that? To make the end-to-end, -end, the holistic view of this business process better, we may have to suboptimize a piece. Well, am, he, am I, the individual who has rationally driven to work the exact same way for five years, going to simply say, I got it, okay, I'll take one for the team? <laughs> we don't do that. And part of the problem is, in time back to business, we don't figure out the resource reallocation necessary to do that. Because sometimes we tell pieces of our business they may have to take a little step back, especially during the MIG learning curve. You know, eventually that decrease in productivity may get better over time. But initially you're going to take a little bit of a hit. We just assume that they're going to suck it up and get it done. We don't help them enough with training. We don't help them enough with resource allocation. So there, there's no incentive for them to take one for the team to make the end-to-end, -end, the whole thing better, which is really what corporate wants to see. So they're disincentivized to take a step back, yet we can't make the whole in these highly integrated products, these ERP systems, process-based systems, to work unless we take that into account. Another major problem we have, and it ties to the one I just mentioned, is one that I label strategic alignment. In most of these programs, I would argue we are not strategically aligned. And if we're not strategically aligned, we have no chance of success. We are like, and again, I'll give you a sports analogy. It's the Final Four this weekend. Imagine if Coach K and Duke came out on the court tomorrow night in Indianapolis, and he decided to give different plays to every player. Calls them the same thing, but you do five different things for this play. That's the lack of strategic alignment. What would happen? They'd all run into each other. And oftentimes that's what happens in these large IT programs. We have all our different constituencies, our different stakeholders, playing from a different playbook. Our management says we are going to buy these enterprise-wide, process-oriented, transformational programs. We're going to use COTS products, we're going to implement them out of the box, we're going to re-engineer our business processes, we're going to do all the things that the literature tells us to do. That's, that's what they are strategically aligned around. Then you get to the acquisition community and the 10 or more functional communities that are involved, plus the IT folks, the contractors, and you lose alignment. The finance team is looking at one thing, the logistics team is looking at something else, the, uh, uh, the procurement groups, the personnel groups, they're all aligned around their own world. And many of them don't want to adopt the out-of-the-box product. And many of them don't want to simply change their processes. And they don't want the sort of uh, simplified version of the way they do business. We have complex businesses and some people are so used to it they can't break away. So you have alignment around simple things like simplicity versus complexity. We have so many stakeholders in these very large programs, these comprehensive business solutions that may be logistics oriented, but they span broader areas than that. And we have so many stakeholders with different perspectives, we wonder why they're all running into each other. And the thing that is going to help us overcome that, and Kevin touched on it, comes back to leadership and governance. The only way we're going to overcome these stovepiped approaches, getting people to optimize around the end-to-end -end as opposed to locally, to be strategic aligned, is to what I've actually started calling, we need for each of these programs almost fanatical leaders. People who have, what definition of a fanaticism is excessive enthusiasm, excessive enthusiasm for these programs. For business systems, though, let's think about that. Department of Defense, how many senior leaders, three-star, four-star, undersecretary-level leaders are fanatics about a business system? Not a lot. That's not what we are all about for the heart and soul of the Department of Defense. We're fanatical about other things. And that fanatical leadership helps us drive phenomenal results in other areas 
of our business, of the Department of Defense. We lack that fanatical leadership around these things. And leadership in this case is not about endorsement. It's about engagement. A lot of times we will get that four-star leader or a three-star leader to endorse an ERP program. And maybe we'll see that leader again in six months for a 30-minute brief. We need that level of leadership across this broad spectrum of stakeholders to engage virtually daily making decisions. Now, whether or not we can afford to do that is an interesting question. I mean, Dr. Carter was talking about how we are doing that in some of the key warfighter-oriented activities of today, and it's making a difference. It is the difference, I would argue, that focus of leadership. Can we afford that level of leadership engagement in these kinds of programs? I would argue if we can't, we're not going to be successful. So we have to figure out how to do that in the midst of our broader mission, given that it is the source of our investment in trying to modernize the business environment to give us the kind of information we need to be able to run and manage the business. So my optimistic point here to conclude my opening comments is we have a new structure in the department that hopefully will give this to us. We have a management structure that has now been put into statute where we have chief management officers at the uh, military department level. We have a chief management officer in OSD. We have deputy chief management officers now at each of those areas. So we have undersecretary level orientation with statutory responsibility to own and manage this business space. That's a first. And I think my optimism is if we can properly institute, institutionalize those capabilities in those leaders and potentially very small teams, they don't have to be big armies of teams, but small, focused, top-down leadership that can try to overcome some of these institutional barriers, we've got a, we've got a shot. It's, it's new. We, we finally now have our final one of these people who is... Uh, who's just been confirmed and at the OSD level, we have a, a confirmation process underway. So we're just getting these leaders on board. We need to figure out a way to get those leaders to help us drive the kind of change that is necessary for us to be successful. And I'll leave my opening comments on hopefully an optimistic note that that's exactly what will, will, will happen. General? Thank you, David. Let me make one last comment before we uh, start the questions, and it's a perspective from uh, four years at Transcom and certainly enhanced by the years in logistics before that. Uh, and it touches on what David's final point is, and it's this. Uh, there are far too many people, uh, I think many of you will agree, judging from your head nods, in our department who get incredibly enthusiastic about weapon systems, the system itself. You can get quite enthusiastic about uh, fighters, bombers, tanks, uh, in deference to Dr. Carter, even MATVs. The issue for those of us at Transcom was not one of modes of transportation. I needed to be an articulate spokesman for mobility aircraft. I needed to be an articulate spokesperson for ships at sea and the modes of transportation. But I can assure you all that the thing that concerned me the most that I felt like I was compelled to focus on was the greatest weapon system I had at my hands, and that was information technology. Because all of the aircraft, either mobility, tanker, or airlift, or ships at sea, or trucks, trains, trailers, barges, I don't care, or people, don't move anything successfully unless you've got the information that can inform you about making decisions about what's moving. And it's as simple as UPS or FedEx or DHL of where's my stuff? Because in that challenge of factory to foxhole, there is some soldier, sailor, airman, or marine who's sitting somewhere in the world in a theater of, of operations, either in a crisis or a Haiti-like environment, wondering, where's my stuff? And it's not informative to know that it's that they've got the aircraft or ships to deliver it. It is, where is my stuff? And so information technology is the key, and ERP solutions for logisticians put it all together. And so much like David, who sounds enthusiastic about 
chief management officers, I would tell you all, I don't believe for a minute until chiefs of services stand up and chairmen and sec def stand up and say the most important thing to me is a successful ERP or information technology solution like we do F-22s and tankers to be, like we have this love of weapon systems, information technology and ERP solutions are weapon systems. They're required, in my view, as a former commander. They are absolutely required. Without them, you can't get from here to there. It doesn't work from factory to foxhole unless you know about it. And there are a great number of people at DLA and Transcom today that understand that in spades. But they are shouted down by the folks wanting to spend incredible time and money and effort on weapon systems. And I'm not denigrating weapon systems by any means. It's just that I see a priority from a parochial logistician that I'd like to see somebody stand up in Congress and start screaming about ERP solutions and funding appropriately for them, refusing to confirm people if we don't get an ERT solution, an you know, ERP solution. How many of you seen that happen? So. <laughs> Now, I hope that some of this discussion has fired up questions in your mind. We're going to run this like an auction. If you don't intend to ask a question, sit on your hands because we will recognize hands no matter where you put them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pointing back over you. There, you had your hand up right away. Yes, it's you in the glasses. Stand up. No, not you in the back. Right there. Um, my name is John Weiler. I represent the uh, ICH and the IT Acquisition Advisory Council. Kevin Carroll is one of our colleagues. Um, in the last uh, year, there's been a lot of attention on the lack of effectiveness of federal IT acquisitions, and even more so in DOD. The March 23rd DAB report that Kevin referenced that was just released uh, paints a very dark picture of how much we spend in effectively acquiring IT. It talks about using weapon system approaches to buy IT is not an effective way. And in the NDAA uh, that's been signed out, Section 804, directs the Secretary to establish a new and separate IT acquisition process. Now, um, for those who've been around during Clara Cohen Act, that was the same directive, <laughs> to streamline the IT acquisition process. And today, 15 years later, really nothing's been streamlined. We've made minor modifications to a set of mil-spec processes designed for 20-year life cycles and now we're asking the same people who own those processes to change them. What is it going to take <laughs> to bring in new kind of thinking that's necessary to affect the kind of change? And can we actually change within, or do we need some external forces and capabilities and expertise to help OSD, NII, and ATL to look within and saying, my processes are ugly, my babies are ugly? Thank David, you. You're, yeah. you're probably closest to that. So. Um, there are, I would say, two very active efforts underway to address what uh, John is referring to. And I actually testified to the uh, House panel on acquisition reform about two or three weeks ago as they were wrapping up um, uh, their piece where they were focused on um, alternative acquisition processes for both IT and for services uh, as two distinct elements of the acquisition process that at least the panel was identifying as opportunities to do differently from the traditional weapon system kind of acquisition mindset. Um, we at BTA have actually been advocates for an alternative, an alternative to the acquisition process for IT, in particular business IT, for about a year and a half. Um, also, for those of you who know the building well, um, it only takes one person to say no to stall innovation. And that's basically what has occurred with the process that we have put forward that would both from an efficiency and an effectiveness, we try to attack this uh, problem from both levels. We, we have an inefficient process that's very paper intensive that requires lots of documentation, some of which is probably not relevant for a business IT system, but we do it anyway because that's what we're taught to do and what the regs require. And there's an effectiveness standpoint. As we've talked about, our effectiveness in IT hasn't been great. 
And so we were trying to introduce some concepts that would help on the effectiveness side, and Kevin referenced one of them uh, with the thing called we, we call ERAM on enterprise risk assessment methods, focusing on risk assessments in the life cycle of the program. Um, our challenge has been getting 100 percent concurrence. Why? Because there's a couple of stakeholders out there that feel like we're taking away their authority in doing this effort to both streamline efficiency and effectiveness. And so that policy recommendation has simply stalled for the last six or eight months. Um, there is another effort that uh, takes some of the ideas that we had even further that's really coming out of NII right now. And one of the interesting constraints on how far we can push transforming these processes is the law, statute. Um, we, uh, in our effort, because we tried to do something quickly, didn't succeed in that, um, was to take on any policy or regulation as fair game, but not battle the statute. What NII is doing, and I commend them for it, is to take that piece on as well. And now it appears from what the House is telling us that they would be supportive of statutory relief or alternatives from that perspective. And so um, we, we see a lot of goodness coming out of NII and some of the things that they're advocating for doing the acquisition of IT differently. Um, what we at BTA would advocate is let us move forward today on the proposals that we've had on the books now for months because there's an immediate goodness there. That's our belief, and I'd say 90% of the people have, who have coordinated on that have concurred with that. We're still stuck in the process of trying to get approval. In the meantime, we would continue down the path that NII, I think, has some really good ideas. They're out of the box, and they will face some of the same uh, obstacles that we faced. Um, but it all comes back to, ultimately, somebody's got to say yes or no, and sometimes we wait for 100% concurrence and we get nothing done. Um, we're at that point now where somebody's just going to need to say yes or no uh, on some of these things. So, yeah, And I would just add that I know David's got tons of bruises from his time to try to change that, and it hasn't worked, I mean, in the long, in the big, big time. And, and, and so I know how hard of a struggle it is. It's almost like we have to have a BRAC commission for IT procure, uh, acquisition reform. I mean, it, it really does feel that way because the resistance seems so strong and powerful that uh, rational minds don't win out. So. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Sheila Ronis with Walsh College and the Project on National Security Reform. Um, real transformations are the toughest things you can possibly do. Uh, having been involved in several, uh, both in the corporate world and in government, they always fail unless you attack the human dimension directly and with investment. Um, do you have any sociologists, psychologists, cultural anthropologists working with you because the kind of enormous task you are taking on will fail unless you address it directly. Well, so the short answer is no, and I guess this goes back to lessons identified versus lessons learned. Um, so again, my opening remarks were consistent with everything that you said, yet we really have not adjusted our approach um, to how we're going about these programs. We have an idea, we turn them into an acquisition, the acquisition arm hires a contractor, it's IT focused, we design something that is strategically aligned to what the original concept was, and then the roadblocks just kick in. Um, so, you know, I, as I mentioned, one way to overcome that is on the leadership aspect, but the leadership aspect has to be able to do and be willing to do the kinds of things that you describe. Um, uh, and, and largely we haven't done that. And I would say look at most of the programs in the department, the, the 14 or 15 or so that I just that I described earlier, are not doing that. Um, it's an idea that we need to get senior leaders in these CMOs to engage on. You know, it's, I, I, in, the, in the ERP system that we implemented at BTA, that's, that's being implemented out across all the other defense agencies. Um, biggest mistake that I made and I, made a, I did a lot of what I would call untraditional things. Um, I certainly tried to be that fanatical leader, in fact, put other responsibilities to the side because I knew without that level of leadership, we weren't going to be successful at all. 
Uh, and one of the things that I did a lot that I thought worked well was I kept saying no to things that my staff felt I had to do. And I kept saying to them, look, I don't need that, so why do you? You know, I'm the director of the agency. If I don't need it, and I'm not going to manage that way, why do you need it? You don't need it. Don't worry about it. No one's going to hold you accountable for that do doing it that way anymore. We're going to do it this way now. That was eventually that, that helped. But here's the thing that I didn't do until after the fact, and we're trying to do better now sooner. And it comes to this whole concept of change management and training. Training we do traditionally for an IT program, you might get a CBT, a computer-based training thing, and maybe three or four days of classroom instruction. I'm sorry. That doesn't cut it. Tra we are changing the way you are doing your entire business. The only way to learn that is by doing it. And what we, in fact, are now offering to other agencies who are coming onto this system is because I have built in my organization, a, a, what I call, I have a center of excellence, a small team, five or six people, and they are my experts on the processes and systems that we have transformed to. The best way, I think, for any other agency to learn and be ready to uh, adopt that new capability is to come and sit with my team for two weeks, three weeks, a month, and actually do it. It's almost like a, an operational test, but do it with people who have already learned all the hard lessons, all the lumps. My folks didn't have anybody to go to, so they learned the hard lumps in production. I regret that. That was not ideal. But I didn't have anybody really to send them to. And that's where some of these sociology kinds of things can come into play, because these are people, these are not people who are operating the system how it was designed to work. They're operating the system as how it does work in production in real life in which you can't anticipate all the things that will really happen. I think we need to figure out a way to do more of that is to get the target audience to understand the real life implications of this new end-to-end -end phenomenon long before they actually are expected to use it. And that requires investment of time. So far, what most of the organizations have told me that I have offered that to, the first thing they, wow, that's great. You'd be willing to do that. Sign me up. And then that goes from this level of the organization down to here, down to here, down to here, to the people who are going to be impacted by that. And their answer is simply, I can't take three weeks out of my time to go do that. I'm running the business today. Okay, but you're going to pay the price. And so I literally had an agency who I offered this to this week who canceled on us because they're too busy. And they're supposed to go into production in October. So I'm going to call them back up again, back up the food chain, and say, do you really want to cancel that? Here's what will happen if you do it. Here's what will happen if you don't. So it's a piece of trying to address, again, the sociology element of people change, um, of getting people to accept and understand the rationale of what doing things differently is all about. There's a, there's a chasm that everyone crosses. It's just really hard to get there, is to recognize, you know, that driving the different commute is for the greater good. It takes you a long time to say, I got it. Makes sense, I'll do it. And there's lots of techniques that we need to do and try. We tend not to do very many of them, and so it's a long time before we get people over that hump. But there, I'm sure there's more we can do there. We just need to think about what it is and how to go about it and, and get people's time to do it. Yeah, and I would just add, it's interesting, the logistics modernization program in the Army, uh, a lot of lessons identified in the CECOM fielding, actually lessons learned when we implemented AMCOM, and all in all, I mean, it wasn't perfect, but all in all, it was pretty easy compared to what I thought would happen and go through, and that's because they did take a lot of the lessons learned and build that in. Now it heads to TACOM this summer, disaster ahead, in my opinion, on the fielding of that, because Basically, to your point, I think they've kind of, um, you know, I got the MRAPs going on, they got all this war stuff going on, that just give us the system and get out of here, and um, we'll take care of it. And we have a GS-15 kind of running it, in charge of it, not an enthusiastic supporter, just someone that got tasked with the job. So in my opinion, we're, that's going to be a real troubled fielding because there hasn't, isn't that psychological, sociological, uh, or training 
uh, feeling about that system, and, and so I'm worried about that when they go out there just because of that. And the money's been kind of cut in that area because training's usually a place you cut sometimes. That's, a, that's actually a really important final point. We always skimp on training. We always do. And especially when a program is going south and it needs more money somewhere else, we cut the training. Um, I have advocated to every program I've spoken to, whatever your training budget is going in, double it. I don't care what it is. It's, it's insufficient. I know it by default. Double it, and you might want to double it again. So it's not only sort of how we train, so the operational kind of training versus classroom training or whatever it may be, but our willingness to invest both dollars and time on the training aspect. It's not, it's readiness. We do this in the military, training and readiness. This is what we do. We know the impact that it has when we do it or when we don't do it. Why do we think it's any different for an IT system? Next question back here, Admiral Lippert. I'm with Accenture, a former director of the Defense Logistics Agency, uh, five years of which we implemented the ERP solution that's being used. Um, as I uh, tell people, I was six foot five and had dark brown hair before we started this process at DLI. <clears throat> but I wanted to jump on with David and what Kevin have said. Yeah, you can put, and I learned this as we went through this, but you can put a, a software system in, in any organization without that much trouble. But it's the people side of the thing that is by far the most difficult. And what we had to really focus on at DLA through a series of trials and errors was extensive change management training for the workforce. Now this, this comment's gonna sound a little bit bad, but the average age of DLA was 48, it still is 48 years old. If we took the new kids, the ones that we just hired, and brought in the SAP and the system, they thought it was the greatest thing that's ever happened to them. At 48 and older, and 48 sounds young to me, by the way, <laughs> there was tremendous institutional resistance to this thing. In fact, uh, I learned that you could send anonymous emails to the director uh, if you went to the library, okay, and I was called <laughs> things that challenged my intelligence, my inheritance, my, uh, everything else about my background that I haven't been called in my 38 years in the Navy. But the point is that we had to go into this change management and had to redo it and redo it and redo it so that the inoculation took. And the second piece of it was what you were talking about is the training. When we did the initial training, it was grossly inadequate. And we had to go back and actually design college, which we called college courses, so it was ERP 101, 201, 301, 401, and then I think we eventually went to a graduate course before we would let people even to use the system because of when we tried it without that, it was just a complete disaster. So I concur with what you're saying, but I just wanted to pile on about from someone who's been through the process. Well, if I can just add a couple of quick points. So we, we also learned, frankly, from DLA. We have a set of courses for our folks as well. If you don't pass the course, you don't get that responsibility. And that was also a culture shock to our folks. I mean, I have to pass a course so I can use an IT system? Well, yes, because if you don't have that basic competence going in, we, we're just going to have problems in execution. And so we had to reassign some folks who weren't able. We had a pretty good throughput rate. 85% or so would pass for this particular area that was at the heart of what we were doing. For those that didn't pass, they got a different responsibility. The other thing I'll, I'll, I'll comment on um, Admiral Lippert's experience, um, five years, single leader, I'll, I'll call fanatical leader in a very positive way. It's by, the, by, <laughs> by far the best example that we've had in the department for not only engaged leadership, but continuity of leadership, which is another huge issue in the department, both on the military side and the civilian side, especially in the political realm, continuity of leadership as well as engagement of leadership is absolutely critical to any program, including IT programs. And DLA under Admiral Lippert is about the only example where I think we can really say that we've had both that level of engagement and the continuity of leadership for any of these ERP programs. So again, Lesson identified, but maybe not lesson learned in terms of what we
can see as a critical success factor, but haven't really pushed through these uh, other, other environments. Here you go, right here, and then I'll come back to you in the corner there next. Stan Soloway with Professional Services Council. Um, hey, Kevin. I want to pile on what Admiral Lippert said, so we'll just keep jumping on this, um, and come back to the change management piece and look at it sort of over a long period as opposed to immediate effect. General Handy and I went down to FedEx in 1999 or 2000. We took a number of folks from DLA with us. We were looking at ERP, and they had the world-class system. And all of the things, David, you described were the lessons they said, don't do anything till you've solved these problems. Of course, we've now spent $9 billion and haven't solved all those problems. But the other thing they pointed out was how they develop, train, and rotate their workforce and what it takes to get to leadership within FedEx. And so there's nobody in FedEx at a senior level who has not spent a lot of time in various parts of the company, but also in the information technology environment. So part of the question, the question I want to ask is, how do we have to change how we develop, whether it's civilians or in professional military training, the, the, the orientation they have, the understanding and the expertise they develop around these systems, because it's so core to what they're going to have to execute down the road. It strikes me that we don't do that other than in a stovepiped environment. So I'll be happy to take a shot at, to start. Um, and I think the, the the comparison with uh, what General Handy was saying earlier at Transcom is, ap ap uh, is completely appropriate to FedEx and other companies as well. Those are information technology companies. Yes, they are transportation companies, but the foundation of FedEx's success is clearly information technology. They had a business model. IT was at the heart of it. They were innovative. They changed the industry, and it was all based on their ability to adapt to new ways of using information technology. They are information. Uh, it's an information company. Um, and there's huge advantages to that that we're not reaping because of some of our inabilities to get there. Um, the human capital element and the career path element of the business mission area of the department is certainly, again, not at the forefront. Not in the military and not even in the, civ in the civilian ranks. Uh, Dr. Carter earlier mentioned that we now have general officer positions or more general officer positions in the acquisition workforce. Um, we have general officer positions for CIOs. Um, we, we largely don't have, you know, we have for finance, they're very limited. Um, and we, what we don't have, both, again, organizationally, um, I think limited as well as individual career path limited is this idea of enterprise business. I mean, it's almost just an idea itself to think about business being an enterprise function, not our individual function. So while we might have somebody spend 30 years becoming a general officer in acquisition, we might have somebody spending 30 years to become a general officer in finance or 30 years becoming a general officer or a three-star level general officer in personnel, how many of them have ever looked at any of the other three? We, we execute business by end-to-end -end processes, not by function. And the technology enablement that we're buying runs by process. Again, I'll go back to DLA. DLA is the example on how to do this. They have reorganize their business around processes. They have process owners. Transcom was our only process owner at the enterprise level of the department, the distribution process owner. Virtually every other organization and every other uh, command level uh, piece of the business is by function. So even if we have career paths, and, and I would say they're limited, for individual business functions, we have virtually no career paths for more process-oriented, enterprise thinking kinds of business aspects of what we do, but that's the heart of what we do. Talk about a cultural shift. If we started reorienting the department, I'm not necessarily an advocate of this dramatic change at the moment, although it's an interesting thought piece, around end-to-end -end processes and more process owners like the DPO, and where we train and equip our people to think along the lines of end-to-end -end business processes. And if we don't want to reorganize the department along those lines, we at least need to figure out how to cross-pollinate and figure out how we are going to grow people to think along those lines. And we largely don't do that. So we do have career paths, I think, limited in individual functions where we do 
grow leaders into those. But I'll tell you, as we look at our ERP breakdowns today, um, half or more of our problem comes when, when we go from one of those functions to the other. And part of the remarkable piece, when you talk about change and willingness to change and you have an ERP solution, this is, happens almost without fail. You talk to an individual owner of a piece of a process and they will immediately recognize the need for change by everyone else. <laughs> it's instantaneous. Everyone else, of course they need to change. It's intuitively obvious to everyone. Well, what about you? Of course not. I can't change. Why would you change me? I've been doing it right for 20 years. Why would you change what I'm doing? Just automate what I have today. And that's part of that thinking is that we only think by function. We optimize locally. And so we don't have that human capital element that thinks more broadly. And how we get that, I don't know. Although, again, I'll come back to we now have somebody in each military department who is chartered to think that way. And that is the chief management official. It's the first time we've ever had in a role, a statutory responsibility, to think cross-functionally in the business mission. Yeah, and I, and I, if I could just add something real quick, too. Very quick. Completely agree with everything that you said, and, and a point that brought that, that showed that to us in the program side was when we had to do, and Dave, you kind of insisted that we did this, when we did end-to-end -end logistics and finance scenarios to run our ERPs through, because we didn't develop them that way, when we kind of tried to do that, and we ran about, I forget the number, 57 different scenarios uh, to go through the transactions that you'd have to occur, we, that's where we found out there's nobody that knew the answers to all of those. They, everybody knew little chunks and pieces again. Again, there's a national logistics, a tactical logistics, and there's a finance. Nobody knows all. Okay. You're up. No, no, I'm, you're, you're tackling when he goes by with that <laughs> microphone. <laughs> Thanks. General. Um, Jim Hall, I'm with IBM. Could I ask you to share your perspectives on the benefits of ERP implementation on uh, departmental objectives of readiness, responsiveness, reliability, whatever, whatever you pick, but let's wave our magic wand, assume it's somebody's lifetime and the, the systems are now in place and uh, where the commercial world gets benefits and faster close and better asset productivity. Where, where do you see the benefit coming to the department when this is all successful? I can just give you one quick example. It's right off the top of my head, and then I'll get the more serious examples here. In, in my world, it would be that the bottle of water that needs to get to Sergeant Jones leaves somewhere in the U.S. and gets to Sergeant Jones without getting diverted or misplaced somewhere in that, that supply chain. It can be a bean, a bullet, I don't care what it is, but someday there will be an end-to-end -end supply chain solution that is ERP-oriented that will, that will guarantee much like our major small package carriers guarantee today through IT that that event happens without question. That's real reliability. That's real progress. Uh, Jim, I, I look at any opportunity for improvement along sort of three parameters, um, efficiency, effectiveness, and cost. And if we're doing these systems and programs correctly, we should gain benefits in all three. And, and General Handy's example touches on all three. How quickly can we get something from here to there? Efficiency. The optimization of the process. There's a throughput element that these systems can provide us uh, based on how they're designed and if we're willing to keep things simple and adopt them the way they are, our throughput, our end-to-end -end process efficiency should dramatically improve. Effectiveness. Um, and effectiveness in information systems is about information. So how accurate are we in both executing the business? So there's an efficiency element. So the, the bottle of water is going quickly to, from A to B, but it's also going from the right A to B. So it's effective. But also our information uh, capacity to pull information from these systems so our senior leaders can make good decisions. So we can reallocate resources if, if necessary. Uh, we, we can be accountable to the taxpayer and to Congress. Um, can we make better decisions based on having this information in a reliable, timely 
manner. And we know oh, many of the decisions we make today by our most senior leaders is based on inaccurate, unreliable, and non-timely information. Well, how, how optimal can our decisions be if that's the case? So efficiency, effectiveness, process, information, and then cost. We spend an enormous amount of money fixing business transactions after the fact ounce of prevention, pound of cure. We live in the world of pound of cure, or ton of cure, or whatever the dynamic may be. The amount of money we spend reconciling and fixing stuff after the fact, both hits efficiency and effectiveness, by the way, but the cost associated with that is mind-boggling. If we use these tools properly, and we put discipline in place to get the beginning of the process right and allow the data and transaction to flow through them the way they were designed to flow, at least to the maximum extent that we can, our cost to operate will go way down. Well, come back to what I said earlier. That may require us, it's me driving, and, I, and my 10% of the people who are driving are going to have to do things a little bit suboptimal. I've got to invest some additional resources up front, let's say 10% more, to get it right so I don't have to pay the 80% on the back end to fix the problem. And we don't do well in that sort of resource reallocation to help us get it right at the beginning. So efficiency, effectiveness, cost, I think affects all of us, and I think that's our opportunity. And trust, because I know I, I ordered a whole bunch of bottles of water from different people only because I, I knew only one of them might arrive, right? right. So I don't have faith in the system. So. <laughs> okay, you, you had to have a quick, and then Monty, I'll get to you next. We, we're very short on time, got about from, three from minutes. From National Defense University, Kevin, Kevin actually addressed my point there. Um, the bottom line is, is the bottom line is, in fact, trust. Jim, that's the answer to your question, is that an effective ERP um, will produce trust across the enterprise, and, and that's what we're going for. Monty, Monty go ahead. Hi, sir. Monty Montero. I, I know that everything's been said, but not by everybody, so I do want to make use two examples and end in with a conclusion that is probably a statement of the obvious. Is this if, a speech or a question? No, it's, 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 it's a, if I can make a statement, is that okay? It won't take long. If you go back, maybe all of us remember Y2K, that was a, it was an event that we thought that the world would cease to exist as we knew it unless some real quick actions were taken. Dr. Hamry was that person. So when you talk about a fanatical leader, somebody that was uh, engaged and not just came through for briefings, everybody was required, all the services, and he had the power and he had the authority and he made it happen. Now that's, that's a positive example. But there wasn't a lot of other things going on, as I recall, at the time. So there was total focus on a unity of effort, unity of purpose, and we got it done. And so it was. It was a non-event. Uh, back a few years from that date, um, I was in Korea with a guy named General Gary Luck. He was the commander-in-chief. They were allowed to call him commander-in-chiefs at the time. And, and, and uh, just-in-time logistics was the bumper sticker phrase at the time. And General Luck would look me in the eye and say, I don't want to hear you talk about just in time, because in his mind it was, what if it's almost in time? And so what that resulted in, yes, we were not efficient, but we were effective. And probably what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq, there's a certain amount of effectiveness versus efficiency. And so to my statement of the obvious conclusion, uh, and I think uh, it was mentioned by Dr. Carter, is the focus for most people, and I think rightly, is on the current ops. It's not that they don't care, people don't care in this room about efficiency, but for now, we gotta be effective. What is a driver to get us to the efficiency part? It could be the, um, not balancing the budget because we won't get there probably in my lifetime, but reducing the deficit. So maybe that is a catalyst that all of us can use to get to the efficiency part. So there's gotta be some event that's gonna force it until we get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. So thanks for your time. Great, thanks Marty. I'd That'll have to be our last uh, speech of the morning, and we've <laughs> clearly run out of questions. My suggestion would be that you know that you're about to take a, a break here, which is, is a wonderful idea, but that you also have, by judging from the hands, a number of questions that I'm sorry we couldn't answer, but I know that Dr. Gantzler can. <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> so I'm sure that you're going to stay and, and 
put them all on him for me, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.